isso, um minutinho, gente. Boa tarde a todos. Prazer recebê-los mais uma vez no Tiaços. Esse é o Tiaços de número... Espera aí, só um minutinho. De número 95. Inacreditável. É... Estamos chegando quase ao centésimo Tiaços, quem sabe esse ano ainda, se não no início do ano que vem. E antes de apresentar o nosso convidado, Roger Brook, nosso querido e afetuoso convidado, queria é, trazer algumas pequenas informações sobre hoje. Hoje é o Tiaço de número 95 e nós estamos apostando que será o último Tiaço é, do governo Bolsonaro. <risos> Temos uma eleição domingo, né? é, estamos aqui na expectativa de que o nosso candidato Lula ganhe, mas, para nós, simbolicamente, queremos desejar que esse Tiaços seja o último antes da eleição do nosso candidato Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva. Sempre importante lembrar que o Tiaços nasce a partir de, várias, de, é, de vários desejos diferentes. Um desejo de democratização do saber, um desejo de encurtar a distância entre o Brasil e os principais pensadores junguianos, pós-junguianos do mundo, um desejo de dar voz a uma nova geração junguiana que tem surgido no Brasil. E o Tiaços também nasce no meio da pandemia como uma tentativa desesperada, também saudável, de sobrevivermos ao inferno que foi o período da pandemia vivido no Brasil. Então, passado três anos, nós estamos à véspera de uma eleição e o Tiaços ratifica a sua vocação democrática, a sua opção pela liberdade, pela vida, pela palavra, e que o país possa voltar a ser um país esperançoso, ético, de bons projetos para o futuro, que isso tudo domingo possa ser realizado. Tem aqui a minha palavra, a palavra da Luciana Ximenes e a palavra da Isa. Então, dito isso, vamos apresentar nosso querido convidado, professor Roger Brook. Professor Roger Brook, ele é professor emérito da Universidade de Duquerne e tem atuado como psicoterapeuta psicanalítico de orientação junguiana por 40 anos. Seu livro, Jung e a Fenomenologia, é um clássico né, da literatura junguiana, foi publicado em 2015. E é um livro que eu recomendo a todos lerem. É um livro absolutamente uma referência dentro do campo dos estudos junguianos. Ele é membro filiado da Interregional Society of Jungian Analysis e professor adjunto do Programa de Treinamento de analistas do Instituto C.G. Jung, de Pittsburgh. Uh, e ele tem, e o seu trabalho acadêmico, tem investigado e reinterpretado criticamente os fundamentos do pensamento junguiano. Roger Brooks esteve no Brasil em 2009, né, Roger? Em Curitiba. O nosso querido amigo Carlos Serbena, eu não sei se está aqui, foi quem o recebeu e pôde viabilizar esse encontro, do qual o Roger traz sempre boas lembranças, agradáveis recordações. Roger, um prazer te receber aqui, uma alegria ter você conosco, há algum tempo que a gente queria te convidar para falar no Teatro, e chegou a hora, num momento muito particular para nós, véspera de eleições, espero que você goste do convite, sinta-se à vontade, a palavra é sua. Muito obrigado por você ter aceito o nosso convite. Oh my gosh, thank you so very much. It is such an honor and a pleasure to be here. And I have to say hello Carlos to you. It's been a long time and I'm just delighted to and honored that you would be here again. I think I should start off with the story that I told a few of you just now which is that when I came in 
when I went to Brazil in 2009, my wife said, you must watch out for those Brazilian women. They're the most beautiful women in the world. And I said, oh, don't worry, sweetheart. I'm, I'm an old guy. I'm, I know the ways of women. Don't, don't worry about it. And so when I arrived, <laughs> I arrived at the airport, I was met by the most beautiful woman in the world. And it was as though God had said, oh, you think you're so clever, do you? Try this one. And uh, anyway, that was just a, it was such a funny moment. I saw her and burst out laughing. The poor girl didn't know why I was laughing. But that's my story of, uh, that was my first encounter with Brazil. Anyway, it is good to be here and thank you for having me. I am going to read um, and I'm going to show, share these slides with you as I go. <clears throat> the, what I've put here on this first slide really are just the, the sections that we are going to be going through. So you have a sort of a road map. Uh, we're going to start off with Jung and so-called non-whites and Jung's transference to Africa. We're going to talk about later, I'm going to talk about individuation and a Zulu term called Ubuntu. Then I'm going to use a reframing of individuation to talk about the withdrawal of projections. And I also want to uh, have a critical reinterpretation of object relations theory since it has had such a significant influence in the Jungian world and draw a few conclusions. Um, I will be showing a few slides, which uh, hopefully you'll find interesting as we go through. The individuation process and the development of consciousness are the central themes of analytical psychology. However, these guiding terms are discussed by Jung and the early generations of his followers in ways that most of us today would find embarrassing. It is not good enough to read Jung in the morning and Andrew Samuels or Susan Rowland or Fanny Brewster in the afternoon with a happy eclecticism and a fuzzy feeling of being open-minded. The shadows in Jung's European view of the world are part of our inheritance too, and no doubt yours in Brazil, of whatever color or ethnicity we might be. Thus the recent open letter by Andrew Samuels and others, as well as his further comments, is both timely and an appropriate context for the present reflections. The open letter was a letter of apology about Jung's racism. Jung first traveled to Africa in 1920 when he visited Tunisia. He describes a sense of moving backwards in time from the 20th century to the Middle Ages. And he idly wonders how these, what he calls these unsuspecting souls will respond to the acceleration of time into modernity. But Jung also imposes a perception that will become familiar and run through his writings. He sees the Arabs as emotional rather than rational, lacking autonomy and closer to nature and childhood. They might have what he calls an intensity of life, he says, but they are prehistoric. And they lack what he calls ego consciousness. We might wonder how Jung could have failed to consider the history of Arab cultural achievements. After all, the people he sees as lacking consciousness invented mathematics had the world's greatest library in the ancient world and are embedded consciously in linear history, celebrating the lives of Abraham, Jesus, and Muhammad. Their culture includes that most highly refined and self-aware mystical tradition, Sufism. The reason Jung failed to regard Arab culture as containing the self-awareness he calls consciousness might be that whiteness is strangely invisible to itself, but visible in its epistemological hegemony. Whiteness does not imagine itself as one color among many, but as no color. As James Hillman wrote in his essay on white supremacy, white casts its own shadow, 
which as white is indiscernible to consciousness defined in terms of white, unquote. Whiteness obliterates shades, colors, and multiplicity. It underlies the fantasy of purity and is therefore the source of splitting and oppositional thinking. White casts its own white shadow, says Hillman, dividing the human world simply into white and non-white. From that perspective, Arabs are non-white. And for the white European Jung, the differences between Arabs, Sub-Saharan Black Africans, Native Americans, and Asian Indians are all but obliterated from the developmental and psychological prerogatives of whiteness. This obliteration of the non-white other was central to the meaning of being white. The invisibility and shadows of Jung's European whiteness have been most of ours if we are white, or to the extent that we are white. I grew up in a relatively educated and liberal household in South Africa. My father taught that a measure of a gentleman was how you treated those less fortunate than yourself. When he became managing director of a mid-sized industrial company nearly 50 years ago, his first order was to rewrite all job descriptions and pay scales free of any reference to color. He was ahead of his time. Yet even in this atmosphere, I was a teenager before I learned that black people had surnames. When I began reading Jung in late adolescence, I learned about the development of consciousness and the spiritual crisis of modern man and about archaic man and privatives being closer to the unconscious and nature with no conceptual problems at all. I thought I was learning about myself, my culture, and about black people, when in fact I was simply entrenching my projections and dressing them up in Jungian theory. Now that I am an American too, I am going to suggest that there are many white Americans who are no further along in their self-awareness culturally than I was in the mid-1970s. I'm not going to speak for Brazilians, but I'm sure you're doing your own mental arithmetic. By the way, I am starting off very critical of Jung, and so I do want to say that it uh, it's not all bad. I'm <laughs> I'm going to, I do actually like Jung very much, and I'm going to, but I'm going to get there shortly. Just please bear with me. The invisibility of whiteness remains a challenge for most white people, but back to Jung. He had wanted to find the missing part of his personality, which he thought would be visible in Africa. However, what was invisible to Jung was not out there in Africa, but in Jung's way of seeing, the eye invisible to itself. When he was in Tunisia, Jung had a dream of an Arab prince. The dream was set in a square, mandala-shaped Arabian city, city with a citadel or caspar in the center. Jung was on a moat surrounding the center and keen to see inside the citadel. An Arab prince attacked Jung, trying to knock him down. Then they wrestled and crashed through the railing into a moat, and it seemed that the prince was trying to drown him. No, I thought, this is going too far, writes Jung. So he pushes the Arab prince's head underwater to subdue him. The scene changes, and Jung finds himself in the presence of what he calls an open book with black letters written in magnificent calligraphy on milky white parchment. Jung cannot read the Western Chinese script, but he knows that this book, sorry, that this is his book and that he had written it. In other words, the book that Jung has written, which we can interpret as the narratives and texts that make up Jung's life, 
this book is only vaguely familiar to Jung, but it is also foreign to both Jung and his subdued Arab prince. Jung continues. I ex this is in MDR, Memories, Dreams, Reflections. I explained to him that now that I had overcome him, he must read the book, but he resisted. I placed my arm around his shoulders and forced him in a sort of paternal kindness and patience to read the book. I knew that this was absolutely essential and at last he yielded. The colonialism in this dream is unmistakable. The European Jung forces the non-white other to submit to the narratives that are Jung's own. Jung's interpretation, even nearly 40 years later, is still an interpretation by an ego in the grip of anxiety. Jung writes that he had experienced an unexpectedly violent assault of the unconscious psyche. He also comes to understand this dream as an early indication of his fear of what he calls going black under the skin, which emerged more directly five years later in East Africa. What is extraordinary is that Jung understands the dream as coming from the self. He says so, but he does not apply, apply his own theory of dreams to his dream. He does not ask how the self might be trying to compensate for the limitations of his ego's view of himself and the world. We might note that there's no good clinical reason for Jung to be so fearful. The mandala image of the self as a squared city with a temple in its center is highly differentiated and what Jung had, would have called civilized. It has no, the dream has no bizarre or psychotic features. The dream shows that Jung's self is better structured and contained than his anxious ego falling through the railings into the moat. Further still, insofar as Jung cannot read the text of what is his own book, we can also say that Jung's self has authorship. It wrote, after all. His self has authorship, symbolic functions, and literacy. That is to say, the self that produced this dream as authorship, symbolic functions, and literacy, where it is Jung as an ego who is being psychologically illiterate. It does seem that Jung here is a victim of his own sin insight, which is, quote, the unconscious mind of man sees correctly, even when conscious reason is blind and impotent. Jung is surprised at the anxiety in his dreams since he had not consciously felt anxious at all. On the contrary, he writes, I could not help feeling superior because I was reminded at every step of my European nature. That was unavoidable. My being European gave me a certain perspective on these people who were so different from myself and utterly marked me off from them. However, Jung does also write, I became aware of how completely I was still caught up in the imprisoned and imprisoned in the cultural consciousness of the white man. What this meant in terms of white cultural history became clearer to Jung when he visited Taos, New Mexico, when he was befriended by an elder, Ochwe Bianco, or Mountain Lake. Mountain Lake became Jung's teacher and talked about what he saw as white people's cruel facial features and their restlessness. He pointed out to Jung that white people also thought with their heads instead of their hearts, and the Pueblo Indians thought they were mad. It is worth quoting Jung at some length here. I fell into a long meditation. For the first time in my life, or so it seemed to me, someone had drawn for me a picture of the real white man. It was as though until now I had seen nothing but sentiment, sentimental, petrified color prints. 
This Indian had unveiled a truth to which we are blind. I felt arising within me like a shapeless mist, something unknown and yet deeply familiar. And out of this mist, image upon image detached itself, first Roman legions smashing into the cities of Gaul and the keenly incised features of Julius Caesar, Scipio Africanus and Pompey. I saw the Roman eagle on the North Sea and on the banks of the White Nile. Then I saw St. Augustine transmitting the Christian creed to the Britons on the tips of Roman lances and Charlemagne's most glorious forced conversions of the heathen. Then the pillaging and murderous bands of the crusading armies. Then followed Columbus, Cortes and other conquistadors who with fire, sword and torture and Christianity came upon, came down upon even these remote pueblos, dreaming peacefully in the sun their father. I saw two peoples of the Pacific Islands decimated by fire water, syphilis and scarlet fever carried in the clothes of the missionaries forced on them. It was enough. What we, from our point of view, call colonization, missions to the heathen, spread the, of civilization, etc., has another face, the face of a bird of prey seeking with cruel intentness for distant quarry. All the eagles and other predatory creatures that adorn our coats of arms seem to me apt psychological representatives of our true nature. This is Jung's most, let me just check, are we okay? This is Jung's most personal insight into the violence and invisibility of whiteness. But Jung still does not make the mental link that this might be the history written in the book he was forcing his Arab prince to read. In my view, Mountain Lake's lesson was the same lesson Jung might have learned in his Tunisian dream if he had made more, sorry, if he had paid more attention to the voice of the other and less to his own white anxiety. When Jung visited East Africa in 1925 and 26, he again described the feeling of going back in time. But what happened here was less about white colonial history than about ontology, the nature of being. Jung was moved by the very materiality of the world coming into presence, of the earth's awakening into world as psyche's ground. He describes how his liberated psychic forces poured blissfully back to their primeval expanses. And how the calling of consciousness was no less than a calling from the world itself to be brought into being through that human form of being we call consciousness. For Jung, the earth world came into being as a temple. This insight into earth as temple and psyche's sacred ground indicates that Jung's confrontation with his own unconscious reaches into the European constitution of identity. For the post-enlightenment European, for the post-enlightenment European, psychological life has withdrawn into the capsule of the head, as he says elsewhere. And mental space is a sort of bottle filled with European air. These expressions describe Jung's experience in India, but he could just as well have, they could just as well describe his experience anywhere that was not Europe or white America. He writes, One would surely go under without the insulating glass wall. Oopsie, let me do this.
one would surely go under without the insulating glass wall. One would be drowned in all the things which we European have conquered in our imaginations. They become formidable realities. Directly you step beyond the glass wall. In this evocative passage, Jung of living behind a glass barrier, Jung is describing a low-grade chronic cultural derealization. He admits he feels dreamlike, but he writes as though it is the others, the Indians, who are living in a dream. And he interprets this derealization as a cultural achievement of an individuating consciousness. It is helpful to understand this when Jung has his next African dream and he again panics. The Jungian analyst Michael Vinoy Adams has discussed Jung's seduction and panic in Africa in some detail, and I am indebted to him. Jung was enchanted to see young African women bare-breasted and confident in themselves, and he felt himself being seduced, not by them so much as by Africa herself. He, he describes the well-known dream of his black Chattanooga barber using a hot curling iron to make his hair kinky, like black people's. In his dream, Jung could feel the heat of the curling iron and he woke in terror. He writes, I took this dream as a warning from the unconscious. It was saying that the primitive was a, was a danger to me. At that time, I was all too obviously uh, too close to going black. The only thing I could conclude from this was that my European personality must, under all circumstances, be preserved intact. As Fanny Brewster recently noted, Jung was afraid of becoming a victim to an African consciousness. As he journeyed northwards down the Nile towards Egypt, moving forward once again in time towards the modern world, Jung experienced the mythic power of Horus, bringing the divine light of consciousness to humankind and releasing us from what he calls the darkness of prehistoric times. Thus the journey from the heart of Africa to Egypt became for me a kind of drama of the birth of light. It was a personal reenactment of the drama of human and especially Western consciousness, breaking free from the regressive forces of the unconscious, darkness, and forms of human light. Life, almost indistinguishable in Jung's mind from nature. On the other hand, if Jung had applied his own understanding of dreams as compensatory from the self, he would have recognized this African-American barber working on his head with heat as being like an analyst working alchemically with heat to effect psychic transformation in an anxious patient, Jung's ego. Jung never escapes the dream in order to analyze it. He reacts to his dream while in effect still dreaming the dream. He is just as frightened when awake and thinking about this dream as he was when asleep and dreaming. Even when writing memories, dreams, reflections over 30 years later, in this regard, he has still not woken up. He is still dreaming the dream of the educated white European man of the early 20th century, unaware that the African culture he saw was a cultural transference fantasy. It is the transference fantasy that reinforced his emerging theory regarding the development of consciousness and the individuation process. These are the privilege and burden of what Jung calls modern man, by which he means the white European. The result is a series of linguistic and imaginal equations that continue to run as the white man's dream through analytical psychology, and not only with regard to Africa. You will recognize these in Jung's work, white European, non-white, black African or other, 
light, dark, civilized, primitive, conscious, unconscious, rational, emotional, disembodied, embodied, scientific, superstitious, masculine, feminine, repressed, neurotic, paranoid, psychotic, adult-like, child-like, personal, impersonal, individual, collective, separation, participation, mystique, moral, amoral. These are organizing terms in Jungian psychology, as you, I'm sure, recognize. This set of transference fantasies about Africa and blackness provides the set of coordinates regarding Jung's model of individuation process and the development of consciousness. There seems to have been a reciprocal relationship between his fantasies of Africa and his psychological theory, each reinforced and was used as evidence for the other. This means that Jung's colonialism remains within us still as the central terms of Jung's developmental theory. Hmm. All right, number two. This is section number two, towards Africa's healing of analytical psychology. Healing is coming. Do not despair. Our task is not so much to analyze Jung as to analyze our own fantasies, both towards people who are culturally non-white other and towards our own inner lives. All this leads to the question in the title, what might, be analytic, what might analytical psychology be like if Jung had allowed himself to be psychically seduced by Africa and let his dreams of the African prince and his black barber heal his one-sided anxious ego. How would we Jungians think today if Jung had allowed his thoughts sprouting from his head to become kinky? Well, are we having fun? Well, we might be pleased to recognize that analytical psychology would look rather more like post-Jungian psychology today. It's already here. The field is already toward moving towards a multicultural imagination, to use Michael Adams's great phrase. It is reviving participation mystique as an indispensable quality of psyche's participatory consciousness rather than as defining it negatively as a form of regressed unconsciousness. It is much more, it, analytical psychology, is much more interested in psychological hospitality than ego control. It is polytheistic rather than monotheistic in its aesthetics. And it is plural in its commitments rather than singular in its fantasies of a self-sufficient internal wholeness. It is already engaged with politics, social issues, including war and terrorism, combat trauma, refugees, and the fate of our planet. It is more self-reflective in terms of the historical context and textual positioning of Jung's writing. More imp most importantly, I like to believe that most Jungians today have given up the colonialist humbug about cultural evolution, even if terms such as the development of consciousness have not been critically or systematically thought through. More of this presently. Significantly, this transformation within Jungian thinking has been guided by Jung himself both in the example of his own personal life in Bollingen and through his alchemical studies. These studies describe processes of dissolution, mixing and transformation into substances that have combined what were previously imagined as opposites. Noting this movement, my colleague here in Pittsburgh, Stanton Marlin, has discussed Jung's alchemical dissolution of the phallocentric and hegemonic image of light, noting deconstructive parallels between Jung and authors such as Derrida and Erigere. Hillman's writings, 
which can be understood as a re-reading of Jung within Jung's own alchemical and deconstructive logic, all point, point away from egoic mastery towards a decented ethic and an aesthetic of hospitality towards psychological life. In his essay on white supremacy, James Hillman points out that Jung's work on alchemy can be seen, like alchemy itself, as a work against whiteness. Whiteness and light cannot be images of life. As Jung said in a 1952 interview with Mircea Eliad, whoops, I'm sorry, I don't have it. This is what Jung said to Eliad. But in this state of whiteness, one does not live in the truest sense of the word. It is a sort of abstract, ideal state. In order for it to become alive, that is individuation, it must have blood, the redness of life. Blood alone can reanimate a glorious state of consciousness in which the last trace of blackness is dissolved." Unquote. It is the alchemical rubedo or reddening, the reddening of blood that dissolves the opposites of white and black, transforming them in the direction of an embodied real life. Hillman goes on to say that alchemy's lesson for us is about the materiality and embeddedness of psychic life in places, with things, in the interiority of our being in the world. This redemption of Jung's colonialism through alchemy is implied in the historical thrust of his work, which was to reach through the rationalism and materialism of European enlightenment to a pre-Renaissance sensibility. Interestingly enough, this is according to H James Hillman, before the time, before the term whiteness was ever used, um, to describe Caucasians. Apparently the first time whiteness was used describing people was 1607. In Memories, Dreams, Reflections, Jung describes the sensibility, this pre-Renaissance sensibility as the world of his number two personality, a private world alive and pregnant with meaning a world from which psychological life is not yet uprooted into the scientific abstractions of his number one personality and idealistic philosophy. Unlike all his contemporary psychoanalytic colleagues, Jung understood the task, of, the historical task of psychology as finding ways for what he, for those he called modern, to reconnect with sources of meaning that nevertheless remain as a sustaining ground between the public assumptions of Western consciousness and the conceit of rationalist philosophy. For all his colonialism and whiteness, Jung seemed to have more affinity with Mountain Lake in New Mexico and with African traditional healers than with his psychoanalytic peers, uh, whose interests were limited to matters of psychodynamics and personal history. Before moving to the next section, which concerns a rereading of analytical psychology's central terms, I, I just want to acknowledge a wonderful professor of philosophy at the University of Cape Town. His name was Augustin Schutt, who introduced me to phenomenology as an undergraduate and who wrote a wonderfully readable little book called Philosophy for Africa. I'm going to skip over some of what I said about him. What follows is a sketch of how we might understand some of the guiding terms of analytical psychology. My hope is that it will feel familiar to your own experience of Jungian psychology. I shall focus on individuation and the withdrawal of projections, which are intrinsic to the development of consciousness. I'll then briefly discuss object relations theory, which I think has been a mixed contribution, a blessing and a curse 
to the Jungian field. Okay, the third section is individuation and Ubuntu. Well, we might wonder how Jung would have described the individuation process if his starting point had been these words by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. My humanity is bound up with yours, for we can only be human together. We are different precisely in order to realize our need for, for one another. The principle here is captured in the Zulu saying, Umuntu ngumuntu ngabantu, which translates, a person is a person through persons. Shute makes this the centerpiece of his philosophy for Africa. What persons are and what persons should become the ontological and the ethical, are mutually implied. The ethical is not merely aspirational, but is det a determinative aspect or constituent of what a person is. Such an assumption, which is common to sub-Saharan Black Africa, offers an important corrective to Jung who only ever discusses the collective as a regressive pull against individuation. Perhaps Jung, Jung's black barber was trying to tell him that the community of persons is both necessary for becoming a person and the home in which one's own personhood is realized. By the way, I suspect that the Jungian community in Brazil has such an experience in which your own analytic community is not a regressive drag against your individuation, but a container in which your individuation can flourish. The most significant African concept for Jung's theory of individuation is this term Ubuntu. Ubuntu defines what it means to become a person but its development is a task of self-realization requiring, requiring the support of others who treat us as persons. It also requires the African virtues that Shoot admires, such as personal responsibility, ethical self-knowledge, courage, humility, forgiveness, and empathy. The Ghanaian philosopher Kwasi Wiredu writes of this African sensibility as follows. Thus conceived, a human person is essentially the center of a thick set of concentric circles of obligations and responsibilities, matched by rights and privileges, revolving around levels of relationships irradiating, irradiating from the consanguinity of household kith and kin through clan, to the wider circumference of the human family based on the common possession of the divine spark. Ubuntu provides an ethical dimension to the individuation process that always seems awkward for Jung. Ubuntu, which Sango, Sango was president, a statesman and president um, of Senegal uh, during and after the liberation from France. Um, Sango says Ubuntu is the mark of African humanism. It is that sense of community which preserves the personal and in which the personal can thrive. It is the animating spirit behind virtues such as hospitality, respect and patience, conviviality, endurance, self-knowledge and sympathy. Within Ubuntu consciousness, inclusiveness, healing and reconciliation rather than marginalization, blame and punishment are guiding values. Through Ubuntu, we would imagine individuation as a process of personal growth and transformation within ever widening circles of identification from family to friends and classmates, to the local community, to the wider society and the world at large. It reaches outwards towards the stranger and the other, to the living and even the dead, to our animal cousins, 
and to the wider earth and sky. From infantile dependency to mature spirituality, our expanding community is the psychological home in which we become fully persons. All right, let me just check something here. All right, then what about the withdrawal of projections? So we're talking about individuation and consciousness and I've moved, I've reorganized our thinking of individuation in a way that is less isolated from the community, which embraces community. So let's think of another theme of individuation and the development of consciousness which centrally is about the withdrawal of projections. The withdrawal of projections are thought to be central to the psychological self-awareness that Jung called consciousness. In my view, Jung conflated therapeutic insight with Cartesian epistemology. Therapeutically, he recognizes that what we hate or long for in others is often split off aspects of ourselves. However, he interprets this therapeutic experience of withdrawing projections epistemologically. That is how he organizes his thinking about it as a return of meaning from the people and things and events of our lives to the inner workings of the psyche or self. It's inevitable that he then bemoans the resultant despiritualization of nature and the world. Jung regards this draining of the world of all meaning as the inevitable burden of modern man, which leaves him with a sentimental nostalgia for what he calls primitive modes of being. In this epistemological form of projection, what we call experience is comprised of mental representations and internally associated meanings. For example, he says, um, okay, I didn't write this down. I'll just read it to you. You will remember these lines from Jung, I am sure. It is my mind with its store of images that gives the world color and sound that supremely real and rational certainty which we call experience, which he puts in quotation marks, is in its most simple form an exceedingly complicated structure of mental images. Thus, there is in a certain sense nothing that is directly experienced except the mind itself. Or again, we're so, in truth, so wrapped up about by psychic images that we cannot penetrate at all the essence of things external to ourselves. All our knowledge consists of the stuff of the psyche, which, which because it alone is immediate, is superlatively real. End quote. A neat little study would be to do a phenomenology of withdrawing projections. We would find that withdrawing projections is in, interpersonally has nothing to do with this organization of psychic reality. The result would be much closer to David Holt's wonderful but seldom noted reflection from many years ago. If we think of the withdrawal of projections as a visual spatial move of return from being psychologically out there to back in here, then the world is indeed drained of meaning. If however we imagine the world of the withdrawal of projections as a shift from speaking to listening, then this world is not abandoned, and in fact, meaning is deepened. In other words, not out there to in here, but speaking to listening. Isn't this what happens when we withdraw projections and see someone as if for the first time? The other's face appears in a way that deepens our sense of that person and ourselves, as well as the meanings of our relationship. The withdrawal of projections makes available the exteriority of the other's face in Levinas terms. It amounts to an awakening of the other's presence, of our capacity to hear, of our ethical responsibility, 
and of our own self-understanding as persons. All this as a single occurrence within the, within the structure of our being in the world itself. Jung himself seems to apply, imply this much when he writes, as the individual is not just a single separate being, but by his very existence presupposes a collective relationship, it follows that the process of individuation must lead to more intense and broader collective relationships. So what then of this world if we Jungians listen instead of speak? Jung feared that abandoning his U European identity would involve a regression into unconsciousness and tend towards psychosis. On the other hand, Jung also regarded this ontological awakening of the world as the deepest meaning of human consciousness. It is appropriate, I think, to pause and suggest that Jung was here even onto something. Um, when consistent with his Western and human and rationalist, humanist and rationalist values, he reacted what again, what a, again, sorry, he reacted against what he interpreted as the deep levels of superstition in uh, Black African cultures. Uh, significantly, Leopold Sango of Seneca also sought to integrate scientific rationalism into his overarching, what he called the civilization of the universal, for the same reason, while integrating the humanism of African values. Um, I have a whole section there on the shadows of Ubuntu. I'm going to skip that. So let's get back to this question about the, the awakening of being, of the earth world's wild presence without the defensive terror of psychosis and personal oblivion. This invites a phenomenological sketch of the differences between psychotic experience um, and a much more original awakening of the world in human experience. I hope that this might clarify what for Jung remained really confused what becomes clear is that the withdrawal of projections does not remove us from the world, but pours us more fully into its wild presence. So this is wild presence versus Jung's fantasy of primitive psychosis. Wild presence is liberating. Psychotic presence is imprisoning. Wild presence has multiple centers of consciousness, each living form engaged in its own world of significance. The psychotic lives at the center of the world, which is oriented towards him in a persecutory way. Wild presence offers psyche increasing range, complexity, and nuance. The psychotic psyche tends to be increasingly narrowed and persecutory. The unseen in a wild presence is a place of open inquiry. The unseen for the psychotic is conspiratorial and malevolent. Wild presence is indeed sometimes dangerous. The psychotic's world is always dangerous and hostile. The wound of an open heart in the experience of wild presence is a place of vitality and a capacity for wonder. The open heart for, a psycho for the psychotic is generally inaccessible behind psychotic defenses, for example, paranoia and depersonalization. Wild presence is a world that is human and more than human. The psychotic's world is rarely more than human, unless it is in a supernatural and uncanny but still anthropomorphic sense. So much, I'm going to go back here, so much for the suggestion that the, war, that the withdrawal of projections leaves us with a despiritualized and disinhabited world, beautifully described by Hillman as a slag heap from which all psyche had been extracted. On the contrary, psychological life becomes, becomes more deeply embodied, spacious, and differentiated. If there is a flowering of psychological life, it is grounded in nature's own logos, 
in its own sacred awakening. All right, let me move on to object relations theory and ancestral relations. I want to just check with you folks. Are we doing okay still? Okay. Given that uh, object relations theory has been integrated into Jungian psychology for over five decades, and for many of us is integral to Jungian psychoanalytic thought and practice. A few critical comments are in order. The aim here is to interpret object relations theory so that what is of value in it can survive the heat of Jung's uh, barber's curling iron. I am rather grandiosely uh, taking the role of Jung's barber and uh, going to do some alchemical work on object relations theory. Object relations theory is about the development of personal identity <clears throat> as it is constituted through the internalizations of one's primary relationships. It is further concerned with the ways in which this relational structure of identity <clears throat> shapes one's relationships with others, including the next generation. The assumption here is that we do indeed, as the Nguni say, become persons through other persons who relate to us as persons. Ethics and ontology entwined. Others are not most originally those to whom we as already formed persons relate. Others are dialectically incorporated into the stuff of our identity. They are as intrinsic to us as our accents. How they relate to us and we to them in those early years are not merely important, but are intrinsic to the internal structure of our well being. What we would call an internal object is the other's participation in the imaginal structure of our being in the world. This internal object is, of course, also relational in its structure. Our parents had parents and so on back through time. Object relations are thus ancestral relations. Like the gods for Jung, we can say, evoked or not, our ancestors will be present. Whenever we open our mouths to speak, our accents reveal the hidden presence of our ancestors. We need to notice critically what psychoanalysis has done with these ancestral relations. It has made the matters of mind. Our ancestors are no longer real relations mediated within and through our imaginations. We have colonized the imagination by stripping it of its world and making it an internal realm of mental representations and so-called symbols. Here's a brief story which I have discussed elsewhere. <clears throat> it illustrates the problem. A Kosa student who was, dis was discussing with me his frustration at Jung's notion of symbols, which he said seemed to make what was symbolized unreal. At that moment, a bee flew through the window. He asked for a moment's silence because the incoming bee announced the presence of the ancestors. For both of us, a moment of synchronicity. We then reflected on how the bee in Western thought is known, in quotes, to be merely a biological organism, and that any other significance it might have is, in quotes, symbolic within the minds of Kosa people. But for the Kosa, the symbolic resonance of the bee is not a matter of mind, but of the coming into presence of the ancestral world. It is true that Jung uses the term symbol to point to a depth of meaning the bee has for the Kosa people, but the price to pay is that he perpetuates a Western Faustian colonialism, claiming the land of bees and flowers and ancestors for our appropriation and whitewashing that world of all meaning. There are then no ancestors 
but only symbols. The term synchronicity is rightly Jung's attempt to acknowledge the meaningfulness of the bee itself. But the term betrays a Cartesian dualism between inner and outer it seeks to overcome, so it cannot be entirely successful. Jungian psychology, so there's my model. I downloaded a model of object relations theory, which is a sort of the psychoanalytic model of mind, where there's a sort of an inner ego and internal objects, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And psychological life is all, in a sense, going on in the head. Jungian psychology too, can offer object relations theory two corrections. The first is to deconstruct it in terms of its historical significance, just as Jung did with Freud's psychoanalysis. Then we can be clearer that what we have theoretically constructed as object relations are ancestral relations. Positively, the essential and creative insight of object relations psychoanalysis is that psychological well-being requires a good relationship with the ancestors. Jungians could not agree more. The second move we can make is to blow object relations model of mind in, as mental representations. That model of mind you see there on the screen is to blow it wide open into the psyche, into that open realm which surrounds and gathers us in history language and imagination, and in places in which the world shines forth in all its multiplicity. I'm going to pull this paper together with just two conclusions. <clears throat> I, th I think that you will recognize, I, I like to believe that most of you will recognize these conclusions in a sense as not something in future, but as something that is already with us in the way we imagine our field. Well, that's my, that's why I say this is, yeah. let me just say it. Hopefully most of uh, these two conclusions won't leave us now in the Jung Jungian field, uh, overwhelmed with anxiety or with heads on fire. One, the notions of individuation and the development of consciousness have to do with being in the world with an open heart, hospitable to the other, yet able to stand and fight when we must. What we call consciousness has many faces and is found in all traditions and cultures. Secular humanism, which is our sort of Western history, has its investments and defenses just as much as any of the cultural of, the, of other cultural or religious traditions. Evoked or not, the gods will be present. Unconsciousness is a fact of life and none of us escapes it, not even by becoming a Jungian, which was sort of my fantasy and perhaps yours too. And secondly, individuation involves ever widening and deepening of our relationships with others, from our immediate caregivers to the family and wider commun community reaching out in self-awareness to the faces of the other, to the ancestors we carry, to God, if so called, to our non-human animal cousins, and to our blue planet. Thank you very much. Obrigado, Roger. Thank you. Excelente, excelente apresentação. Do you want me to continue to share screen or can I leave it at this point? Eu acho melhor tirar, né? Deixar agora mais os rostos aparecendo. Tá? É... Bom, Hi. vamos abrir para as perguntas e debates. O mesmo protocolo de sempre. Quem quiser fazer pergunta, coloca o nome no chat. Eu chamo e a pergunta, e a pessoa faz a pergunta. Roger, é, do, um, primeiro uma questão curiosa. O nosso último encontro do Tiaços foi com a Ellen Morgan, que apresentou o livro dela sobre branquitude. 
e que me parece que dialoga muito com o teu texto em muitos lugares. Então, me parece que essas duas palestras seguidas compõem um campo de, de interesses que, que dialogam de maneira bastante interessante. Queria, fazer, queria começar com uma questão. É, você faz uma pergunta, que é uma pergunta muito interessante, que é o que teria, o que poderia ter ocorrido com a teoria junguiana se Jung tivesse interpretado o sonho do árabe de outro modo? Né? Eu me lembrei que o Hillman faz essa mesma pergunta no livro Healing Fictions, aonde ele menciona, naquele episódio do Jung com a Salomé, e a voz diz, isso que você faz é arte. E o Jung se recusa e diz, não, isso não é arte. E o Hillman pergunta, o que, que teria acontecido com a psicologia junguiana se o Jung tivesse acatado a voz de Salomé, que tinha dito isso é arte? Você acha que esses dois episódios se equivalem? É, o do sonho árabe e a da voz que diz isso é arte? Has your question been translated? Okay. Well, I, I did hear. I did hear. I only heard the English. Has it been translated into Portuguese? Sim. Oh my God! <laughs> Nós estamos magic. falando em português. <laughs> magic. Uh, What a lovely question. And uh, I think more than answering it, it's just nice to open it up for, for our imagination. And I think you're absolutely right. I hadn't uh, gone in the direction of Salome and art and so on because I was you know, focusing on Jung in Africa. So I didn't think laterally. I tend to be rather linear. But you're absolutely right. I think they're very compatible. They might take... Uh, Uh, things in slightly different ways. You know, I think that the Jung's Negro Barber and his so-called Negro Barber and uh, his anima uh, would certainly understand each other, but they're not quite the same. <laughs> Lovely question. Oh, let me answer it this way, though. I'm going to say that in the same way that I think analytical psychology has moved on from Jung and that we are sort of embody it, especially through our analyses and our com Jungian community, that we have dropped into a way of being Jungians that is very different from Jung. And I imagine that that means that a lot of the anima, what was anima for Jung, is now part of our own sense of our being in the world. So I think it's already here, and we don't have to look out there to find it. We can just look around us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Acho que a gente vai poder voltar a isso um pouquinho mais tarde. Vamos aqui, aqui para as perguntas. Tem duas perguntas. Lu, por favor. Oi, Roger. Super obrigada pela sua palestra. Você perguntou lá no mês se a gente estava se divertindo. É difícil se divertir com esse tema, mas você, desse jeito delicado que você apresentou, esse tema tão sangrento, fez com que eu me divertisse. Obrigada. É... Eu, eu te ouvindo, eu lembrei de, uma, de, uma, de, um, de um pequeno evento que aconteceu comigo no consultório, que foi uma paciente que me procurou, me perguntando, a primeira pergunta que ela me fez foi como eu me reconhecia. Foi a primeira vez em todos os meus anos de clínica que alguém me pergunta como eu me reconheço, em termos de raça, né? E eu respondi para ela como branca. E ela, e ela era uma negra, né? Me fazendo essa pergunta. E eu, e eu é, e, a, e apesar de, das indicações e, e de, dela gostar de mim, né, ela não ficou para análise, porque ela precisava ser escutada por uma negra. Mulher, inclusive, ela queria uma mulher negra. 
A minha pergunta é, você, você acha que, isso, que a nossa branquitude, apesar da luta, apesar do estudo, apesar da teoria toda que a gente tem, a nossa branquitude interfere na nossa escuta? É, é, eu queria que você me falasse um pouquinho do que, que você acha dessa demanda dessa minha paciente. E a outra coisa é, aí eu fiquei pensando quem indicar para ela, né? E foi muito difícil lembrar de uma pessoa na nossa comunidade que fosse negra. Então, eu queria ouvir os seus comentários sobre isso. Obrigada. There is something about, let's say, if you're white or whatever, whatever shade or, or you know, color you are, um, it has a certain density, a givenness that uh, is just a kind of a fact with its own elaborations. It is the same as if you're male or female, or, or maybe if you're straight or gay or something else as well. Um, there are certain, we, we inhabit the world in certain ways, but I think what makes us um, psychotherapists is that we, I, I do think we don't have to be completely bound by that. Um, what I think, I think that, for example, if this person, I, I've worked with people where, where the issue of my be, black people, where the issue of my being white um, is, emerges, I mean, it's right there. So I usually deal with it actually in the very first session. And if the person said, what color do you see yourself? I would say, I'm, I would say, uh, I see myself, I suppose, as insofar as I see myself as having a color, I do see myself as white. But before I uh, just leave it at that, I'd like to ask where your question is coming from. Um, tell me about your question. I, my, my assumption is that you have a history that makes, uh, that makes this a little bit difficult or something of a challenge between us. Can you tell me about that? And I've I've been able to work with with uh, people who who are uh, you know very different from me in in color or ethnicity or sexual orientation by tracking their experience rather than simply answering their question and and leaving it at that. Um, similarly with religious people, you know, there's some people who are concerned that I might not be Catholic or I might not be uh, Lutheran or that I might be Christian and that's a problem. And you, instead of answering, if you track it, what is the difficulty? Very often the, the, the answer is just no longer necessary. So that's, um, when I was in South Africa during the state of emergency and the, and the turmoil of the 1980s, I worked underground with young black activists. An Anglican priest was my contact, and he would refer me to a safe house where I would drive and park maybe several hundred meters away around the block, and then I would walk a circuitous route to a safe house, which might be a dentist's office once or a house of, and so on. Uh, and I would work with young black activists who were traumatized by the security police during the state of emergency. And the fact that I had been, they had been referred to me by this Anglican priest, who was a white Anglican priest, gave me a legitimacy or a credibility uh, and we got on fine. So even in as difficult a situation as that, uh, it's not insurmountable. Obrigada, Rosa. Obrigado, Lu. Wagner, contigo, meu amigo. Olá, está me escutando? Sim, sim. Beleza. É, professor Bruno, é muito prazer em conhecê-lo, né? Eu acho que uma das coisas mais interessantes quando temos a oportunidade, né, de escutar uma, uma conferência, uma palestra, é o quanto que ela 
é, provocativa em termos de questões, né? o quanto que elas nos desafia né? é, em termos de possibilidades né? de, de questionamento. E uma das coisas que eu gostaria, e talvez eu tenha sentido um pouco de falta na sua, no seu discurso, na sua fala, é que diz respeito a questões relacionadas ao poder. Né? A questão do negro, a questão é, da, 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 de, do outro, aquele que, nos, aquele que nos difere, tem ali, vamos dizer assim, uma, um olhar que se assemelha à questão da desumanização do diferente. Né? Então, o que, que nós poderíamos pensar, né, já que constitutivamente a nossa psique ela é, ela, ela é portadora de uma bipolaridade, né, ela tem uma dualidade, como é que nós podemos escapar dessa armadilha né, de considerar, vamos dizer assim, um branco humano e um não branco desumano? Né? Há ah, aí uma proposta, ou talvez uma, uma energética na psique que aponta necessariamente para uma questão de poder? Obrigado. Eu acho que é uma pergunta muito profunda. And I don't know that I am more capable of imagining an answer than any of you. Um, I thought, although I didn't use the word power, I did think that I dealt with it quite extensively uh, when talking about Mountain Lake's view of the white man and his cruelty and conquest, and that long quotation from Jung, where he talks about white Western, white Western history taking over and conquering and destroying other cultures. Uh, there is the reference to power in his dream of the Arab prince, where he uses the phrase of being in a kind of paternal fatherliness, forcing him to read the book. I didn't use the word power, but it is very clear there. Uh, power, power is, is often a, is, is a real shadow. Um, and it is the shadow of relationship, the shadow of eros, if we like. And, uh, Yeah, it can pop up in all sorts of ways. It, it, <clears throat> it is a power dynamic within us. And I mean, I don't know about others, but in this last few years in class, there is a kind of some of the students on the, on the far left also make incredible power moves, although completely denying it. I was told by a graduate assistant I'm not a graduate assistant, a graduate student in my class. As a straight white man, what you say has no legitimacy. And she thought that I was the dehumanizing one. <laughs> We are, I don't think any of us are virgins. I, I meant that metaphorically. <laughs> Obrigado, Wagner. É... Carlos Serbena. Conhece, Roger? Oi, bom dia. É um grande Carlos prazer ouvir você, Roger. Eu um, lembro aqui Curitiba, quando você veio para Curitiba. Been forever grateful, foi um grande aprendizado. Uh, foi uma visão bem diferente da psicologia analítica que veio. E eu queria perguntar para você, na realidade, o, o que você falou ficou ressonando. Ele está trabalhando até com seus textos ao longo do, do tempo aqui na universidade. E eu queria perguntar para você uma, a, o seguinte, uma hora você falou um pouco da sombra do Ubuntu. É, o Ubuntu dá uma hum. nova visão de self, né, que eu acho que complementa essa questão, porque o, o, você mesmo coloca né, o self para Jung, é uma visão muito de uma descoberta interna, e a gente está entrando exatamente nesse momento em que a gente consegue perceber que o, o eu 
ele é também o eu relacional. Tá? E o Ubuntu parece que vem bastante nessa direção de uma nova forma de subjetividade que é relacional. Eu gostaria que você pudesse falar um pouquinho dessa sombra dessa, desse Ubuntu. Hmm. Ok, let me just go here. Recent items. Uh, the slides. I'm going to share the screen again and just show you this quickly. Can I do that? I won't be long. This will just take a moment. Uh, it's such a good question, Carlos. And I just skipped over it because of time, really. But uh, Sango and Jung and Weredo and Schutt all, all see that, that the notion of Ubuntu Uh, does have its problems. Ontologically, Ubuntu is fine, but of course it is taken up in the, in the factual lives and of ordinary people where its ontological structure or its ontological meaning can easily give way to practices that do carry shadow. First of all, nepotism, since Ubuntu does sometimes not re reach be beyond one's own however defined you so you get terrible corruption um you know in sort of local communities uh, now where the notion of ubuntu means that others outside one's own little tribe or group or clan are kind of dehumanized or or or, or the money doesn't go to them there's sort of local enrichment and what we call corruption it's just terrible Uh, secondly, there can be the loss of the very individual personhood that we have been celebrating, since the desire for consensus can lead to a kind of group think. Interestingly enough, Wiredu, the Ghanaian philosopher, wrote a passionate plea for a non-partisan politics in Africa. He thought that political parties were just uh, uh, such an assault on the individual and on individual responsibility and thinking that he, he wrote a very strong political treatise against political parties for this reason. And then thirdly, when humanism becomes a total sort of organization, a theoretical or conceptual organization for interpreting the real, it slides towards a kind of anthropomorphism, that's to say a human-centered understanding of natural phenomena, sometimes with horrible consequences, you know, so de uh, stillbirths or miscarriages or natural disasters from tsunamis to tornadoes to birth defects uh, are all then thought to have some sort of human cause. And so people then search for malevolent human involvement in such natural phenomena. Uh, with absolutely horrible consequences. Whoa! I don't want to cancel the meet. Don't want to leave the meeting. I want to stop share. There we go. How can I get rid of my share? Ah! You can see me. Okay, I can't see any. I've still got this. Uh, Thing up. There we go. Okay, I've got rid of it. Thank you. Sorry. So those are those were my short reflections on uh, the ethical shadows. Carlos, did that uh, does that ring a bell with your own thinking? Faz sim, é, faz sim. E a gente pensa até na situação atual do uhum. Brasil. A impressão que dá é que um Ubuntu regressivo ele é muito ligado aos movimentos uhum. de massa também, não? Uhum. 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 Yeah, and then in the United States, I mean, we have this, we've had the same problem as you all well know. Um, it's a terrible thing how some leaders bring out the best in us, but other leaders bring out the worst. 
and bringing out the worst always involves splitting and uh, all the splitting and projection and all the ethical consequences that come with that. I, I fear for our countries. I fear that the West is on a knife edge, actually. Obrigado, Carlos, pela sua participação. Prazer. Prazer imenso ouvir. Agradeço ao, ao Marcos pela oportunidade e também ao, novamente ao Roger. É muito prazer ouvi-la. Sempre prazeroso e muito enriquecedor. Obrigado a todos. Thank you so much for having me. God bless. You have a wonderful organization. And uh, I've heard about it through Mark Winborn, uh, who, and so on. So my very best wishes to you. And thank you again so much. I would love to visit. Roger. Temos tempo para duas perguntinhas ainda? Well, you do, but I tell you what, I need, I'm, I'm an old man and I must pop next door for 30 seconds. Good <laughs> morning, Isa. Good morning, Isa. Setenta, setenta traduções. Noventa e cinco traduções. Noventa e cinco teaços, né? Teve alguns que não foram traduzidos. É, vamos lá. Ana, eu não sei quem é, qual Ana, tem várias. É, é está aqui. Ana, tudo bem? <risos> tudo bem, Ana Urpia, tá? Sou do é Ipamaria. Então... É, primeiro agradecer, viu, Marcos e todo o grupo por esse, né, por essa oportunidade de trazer essa discussão para cá, né, para para esse para o nosso campo analítico aqui, né, no Brasil. É, e queria a minha pergunta, Roger. Agradeço também sua sua fala maravilhosa, assim, fiquei muito feliz de poder estar aqui. E a minha questão, assim, é, é no seguinte pelo seguinte caminho, assim. Eu, me parece, Roger, que um dos desafios da comunidade analítica hoje, pelo menos a brasileira, né, que é essa em que eu me encontro, é, em primeiro lugar, é, pensar a África como uma África múltipla. Acho que esse é um dos nossos desafios. Superando a visão junguiana, né? dominante, vamos dizer assim, por conta do nosso próprio ancestral Jung, é, superando a visão junguiana de uma África única, é, unicamente tradicional. Então, é, e mesmo assim, uma África tradicional também é, é, sem diversidade, como se for, houvesse apenas uma África tradicional. Então, é, eu queria que você falasse um pouquinho sobre isso, se você concorda. É, queria ouvir um pouquinho né, sobre isso, o que, é que você pensa sobre it, essa it questão. É very... muito... Yes, that's absolutely right. I mean, you know, the, the Zulus and the Tunisians or the Egyptians, uh, you know, are, are probably more different than the Egyptians and the Swiss. And... Um, And of course, there are also personality and personal and local differences that are within a group that are bigger than between groups. So diversity runs all the way through. There was a very interesting book called on, I had, I read a very interesting book of essays on African philosophy, uh, where the question of similarity and difference was addressed by many of the authors. And 
when I spoke of sub-Saharan Black Africa and the term Ubuntu and that kind of sensibility, uh, I was drawing from those authors who said that there is a kind of that that there is that that is something that links those different cultures all the way from Nigeria and Ghana on one hand, all the way down to South Africa and the, the Kosa and the Zulu there. Um, so there are differences, but I also think that there, it does seem that, that the notion that a person is a person through persons and the communal, a communal definition of the person uh, and ethics within that context, uh, that is something that is, I understand to be similar. Um, but, you know, as there's also Muslim influence and Christian influence coming from North and South, and these all, this all shifts in various ways, these ethics and sensibilities. It is very important that we don't slide slide into groupthink. Eu vou, é, Roger, eu vou pegar, eu vou fazer as duas últimas perguntas. Eu vou pegar carona um pouco na pergunta da Ana, é, porque não poder falar, né, Ana, de uma alma africana já que são muitas Áfricas, também desmontaria a ideia de uma alma brasileira. Né? Não é possível falar de uma alma brasileira num país tão multifacetado, diversificado, heterogêneo. Então, me parece que essas tentativas de captura homogêneas, grupais, elas inevitavelmente acabam por apagar as diferenças que são tão fundamentais. Né? Faz sentido, Roger, para você? I think angels would fear to tread into that answer. Uh, I think we must just be very careful and respectful. But but places do have a bit of a soul. I mean, when you've been out of away from the country and you feel that you return home and you are surrounded by the voices and accents and languages of Brazil. I imagine that many of you feel the the joy of being home, even if it's difficult to say what, put into words what that means. When we do start to put into words what that means, we can often sound cliched, or, or, or in other words, how it speaks to our soul uh, starts to become problematic. And yet there's a certain, something there is true as well. I know that when I get back to South Africa, when I fly back to South Africa and I'm surrounded by, by the language of Zulu and Kosa, which I don't speak, by the way, sometimes I'm just, I'm just almost in tears with the joy of being home. I don't know what to say about that. It speaks to my soul. But I don't. It's not that I'm thinking, therefore, that we all are somehow equal or we share something necessarily, or uh, it's difficult to put into words. That's just me. Olha, duas últimas perguntas. Primeiro, é uma, uma fantasia apocalíptica que eu tenho, que é... Às vezes, vendo as publicações recentes do mundo junguiano, é, Andrew Samuels, Monica Lutti, é, Renos Papadopoulos, Stefano Carpani, eu tenho a impressão de que a psicologia junguiana ela tenderá a se tornar uma psicologia social ou uma psicologia do social, ela deixará de ser psicologia clínica e vai se tornar uma, uma, uma teoria sobre o social. Primeira pergunta, o que, que você acha disso? É, faz sentido para você? Essa perspectiva é, é possível ou não? E a segunda pergunta, e o Brasil? O que, que você acha do Brasil? 
Que fantasia você tem sobre o Brasil? Do I have? Sim. Sim. Suas. The, uh, the first question is very interesting. I have not thought of that anxiety or concern about the move towards a social psychology. But when you asked the question, I could feel it. I think even in the clinic, something of the move to a kind of an interpersonal psychoanalysis risks losing something of the depth that, uh, in fact, a, a lot of the depth that Jung had to offer. I, I was surprised when an analyst such as Warren Coleman, who was the editor of the Journal of Analytical Psychology, would describe himself as an interpersonal psychoanalyst. I would never, I'm not actually, I would never describe myself as an interpersonal psychotherapist, although I work in the transference, counter transference relationship a lot. I have much too deep a sense of the extraordinary mystery of the self and its strange intelligence that produces dreams, for example. When we say we interpret dreams, what we mean is that we are trying to understand the way in which our dreams have already interpreted us. And that comes from a, myst a mystery, we call it the self, that has extraordinary depth and can never be dissolved into the interpersonal, let alone the purely social, in my view. So I like that. I like what they do. But gee, I would be alarmed if that became dominant. That's my view. Okay, so that's my first position. I don't know what you think of that. Uh, the second one is my fantasies of Brazil. Words come to mind, heat, jungle, uh, a little bit exotic, sexy. Uh, sometimes violent. Um, energy, high energy. Uh, did I say beautiful? Um, so those are some of the first things that come to mind. Do you mind? I told you I got, I was, I, I told you at the airport, I met the most beautiful woman in the world. That's not my fault. That's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> Tá ótimo, Roger. <laughs> Roger. But I imagine, I also imagine heat, and when I follow that one, I go, I get heat, sweaty, wet. Uh, yeah, uh, Brazil is much more like Hillman's uh, image of soul than uh, his image of the peaks in peaks and vales, you know, the, the Swiss mountain tops uh, or the Alps. And I know you've got the Andes in Brazil. But I tend to think of the I tend to think of the Amazon more than the more than the uh, the Andes. <laughs> That's a funny question. I've I've given of myself I've given much too much of myself away. <laughs> Queria te agradecer pela tua presença, pela tua generosidade em estar conosco. Um prazer te receber. Você é muito simpático, muito agradável. Tua palestra foi ótima. Abre, abre para nós uma série de questões importantes, porque é, temos aí uma, uma relação de vizinhança, Brasil e África. Queria te agradecer, Roger. Uhum. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Marcus and Isa and, and everybody. Thank you so much for having me and your hospitality. I'm deeply touched. If there was ever a chance to meet again, that would be fun. But thank you. Com certeza, com certeza.
Espero que a gente possa nos revermos em breve, em condições melhores no país. Torça por nós, ama... domingo, torça por nós. Grande abraço, Roger. Ours too. Ours too. Bye bye. Pessoal, obrigado. Mais um encontro do Tiaços, foi ótimo. É... Eu acabei de mandar no grupo o texto que o Roger escreveu sobre o Ubuntu, que o Serbena me passou, está compartilhado já, faça um bom uso. E nos vemos na sexta que vem, né, Lu? Sim, dia 4, com a Ruth Williams. Alma e Espírito na análise indiana. A Ruth Williams é uma analista indiana fundamental, sabe? É, velha guarda, 50 anos de clínica, lançando um livro novo agora sobre essa questão da espiritualidade da clínica junguiana. O livro dela é cheio de casos clínicos. Vale a pena a gente vir é, testemunhar. Tá bom? Grande abraço. Boa votação domingo. E... Olá, lá, hein? <risos> Falou. Tchau, Isa. Obrigado. Beijo, pessoal. Até lá. Até a próxima.